Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh, in the last uh, two years, especially since the release of ChatGPT, we have seen uh, language models become increasingly more capable on a variety of NLP tasks. For example, they can generate a coherent uh, text, which is almost indistinguishable from that of a human. Uh, they can uh, accurately translate from one foreign language to another, uh, and they can even write code in most of the major programming language, uh, languages. However, despite all these uh, impressive abilities, we also know that um, LLMs suffer from some um, important limitations. Uh, the most uh, well-known issue is that of hallucinations, which is when uh, a model gives an answer which is uh, totally incorrect, uh, but uh, in a very confident and convincing way. Another uh, common problem is that of outdated or incomplete knowledge. Uh, this happens because uh, LLMs were trained on data that was collected up to a certain point in the past, and so they don't have any knowledge about more recent events that happened beyond that point. Uh, we should also mention their inability to uh, perform actions in the sense that uh, a language model by itself uh, cannot uh, directly access information stored uh, in an external database. Uh, and of course, uh, we know that uh, all LLMs have a maximum token limit or context window, uh, which means that uh, it wouldn't be possible to give an entire archive of documents as input uh, to a language model uh, because uh, uh, we would go above the token limit. Now, these are inherent uh, issues which cannot be solved by just uh, increasing the size of the model with more parameters or uh, scaling the computation power with more GPUs. Uh, instead, there is a uh, technique that was developed a few years ago by uh, researchers at Meta, which uh, addresses these challenges. It's called uh, Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG for short, and it works in the following way. Let's say we have uh, a language model and uh, a database with uh, documents which are either private or very recent. So in any case, these documents were not used during the training of the LLM, and uh, it's not possible to directly ask the model any questions about uh, their content. Uh, the first step in the RAG process is to um, um, query the database using uh, a type of algorithm called semantic search. This will uh, look for uh, fragments of text which are semantically similar to the user question and return uh, the top results. The motivation for doing this is that uh, the documents which are the most similar uh, to the question are uh, probably, are usually the ones that uh, also contain the answer. Uh, this is what we mean by retrieval. Uh, there is a common misconception that uh, the LLM is somehow involved in the retrieval process, but this is actually wrong. Uh, the retrieval can be done entirely without uh, the help of the LLM. Uh, then the next step is to append these uh, retrieved documents uh, to the initial question and create a larger prompt which contains both the question and the potential answer. Uh, this is called augmentation and it's basically a form of prompt engineering. Uh, and finally, we give this uh, enhanced prompt uh, to the LLM which will uh, generate an answer based on the, the retrieved information and not on its um, original training data. Uh, this is essentially how RAG allows an LLM to answer uh, questions about topics which uh, it hasn't seen during training. Uh, in addition to the answer, we could also provide the, the retrieved documents uh, as a reference list so that the user can, uh, can check uh, how well the generated answer matches with the original sources. Uh, out of all these steps, uh, the retrieval is the most uh, important and difficult one, and uh, in order for the retrieval to be successful, uh, there are a few data preprocessing steps that have to be done in advance. Uh, specifically, we have to split every document from the database into uh, smaller fragments of text, which um, are called chunks. This is necessary because uh, we want to be sure that in the end, uh, the LLM will receive only the most relevant pieces of information, and uh, not entire uh, documents which might also contain redundant information or might be too large to fit in the context window. Um, ideally, every chunk should uh, contain information that is semantically related, and uh, uh, there are different strategies for how best to um, split a document. For example, we could uh, 
uh, split it into chunks of fixed equal size, or we could do the splitting based on uh, a list of uh, special characters. After splitting, we use uh, an embedding model to convert every chunk of text into a vector of real numbers. Uh, we do this because uh, the um, algorithm for semantic search is a mathematical operation which, uh, ha which uh, uh, has to be applied uh, has to be performed on numerical vectors. It cannot be applied directly on plain text. Uh, the vectors are then uh, uh, stored and indexed into a, a special type of database which is optimized for handling high dimensional vectors. And uh, when the user asks a question, the question doesn't have to be split into chunks. It can be directly embedded and uh, compared with uh, the rest of the vectors. Now, in order for these uh, vector embeddings to be useful, uh, they have to satisfy a few basic properties. The most important one is that uh, the geometric relationship between any two vectors should reflect the semantic relationship between the corresponding chunks of text. So this means that uh, chunks that are uh, semantically similar should be embedded into vectors that are located next to each other. And uh, on the other hand, if two vectors are far away, then they should correspond to chunks which are not related. Uh, for example, in this image, we can see that uh, uh, chunks which are referring to the Python snake are grouped next to each other in uh, one part of the vector space, and uh, chunks which are uh, related to the Python programming language are clustered, uh, in, a, are clustered in a separate region. And uh, if the user asks a question about one of these two topics, the question is embedded into a vector which uh, will be located in the corresponding cluster uh, hopefully somewhere close to the answer. So uh, we need to have um, a way of uh, finding out which vectors from the database are the nearest neighbors to the uh, query vector. And this is not an easy task because uh, uh, in reality the vector space is not two-dimensional like in this picture. Depending on which uh, embedding model we're using, uh, the vectors could have uh, hundreds or even thousands of dimensions, so it's not possible to identify uh, the nearest neighbor by uh, direct visualization. Uh, instead, we have to uh, select a metric that can, we have to use a metric that can measure distance between vectors in a high dimensional space, and uh, there are several options for, uh, for doing this. Uh, let's say we have two vectors, A and B. Uh, one metric that can be used to measure uh, vector similarity is the Euclidean distance, uh, which is given by the straight line distance between A and B. Uh, this is an intuitive metric because it depends on the distance uh, between the um, corresponding uh, coordinates. If the coordinates are close to each other on uh, all the axes, then the vectors are also close and uh, vice versa. Uh, another metric is the dot product, which is given by the product between the lengths of the vectors and the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, this is a metric that uh, depends on the orientation of the vectors in the sense that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dot product of two vectors will be uh, larger if the vectors are pointing in the same direction and it will be smaller if they're pointing in opposite directions. And uh, probably the most popular uh, similarity metric is the cosine similarity. Uh, which is uh, just the cosine of the angle between the vectors. Uh, it depends only on the angle and uh, not on the length or um, the orientation of the vectors. Uh, and in particular, if the vectors are normalized, if they have uh, length equal to one, then uh, the dot product is the same thing as the cosine similarity. Um, now, uh, the choice of the of the a uh, similarity metric is quite important because it can have a direct influence over the final results of the semantic search. Uh, consider the following example. We have three vectors, A, B, and C, and uh, we would like to know which one is closer to A. Is it B or C? Well, the answer depends on which metric we're using to measure the distance. Uh, if we use Euclidean distance, we see that uh, the distance between A and B is the same as the distance between A and C. So both B and C are equally close to A. Uh, but at the same time, we see that uh, the angle between A and C is much smaller than the angle between A and B. So if we use cosine similarity, then A is closer to C than it is to B. Uh, and there are also cases where it can happen the other way around. 
So in, in this example, uh, we see that the angle between A and B is uh, equal to the angle between A and C. Uh, so uh, the vectors A and B have the same uh, uh, cosine similarity as the vectors A and C. Uh, but on the other hand, we uh, notice that uh, the Euclidean distance between A and B is much smaller than the Euclidean distance between A and C. So the main point is that in both uh, uh, examples, uh, if we're using one metric, then, then the vectors are uh, uh, equally close to A, while if we switch to the other one, then one becomes closer than the other. That's why we say that uh, uh, the choice of the, uh, the, the concept of the nearest neighbor can change depending on our choice of the similarity metric. Uh, after we've um, selected a similarity metric, we can use it to uh, identify which vectors um, uh, from the database are the nearest neighbors uh, of the query. Uh, the easiest uh, approach would be the following. Uh, compute uh, all, the, uh, all the distances between the query vector and uh, all the other elements of the database. Uh, sort them in order of increasing distance, and then just uh, return the vectors that have the smallest distance. Uh, this approach is called the uh, k-nearest neighbors, or KNN for short. Uh, it's, a, it's a brute force approach because we are iterating over all the elements of the vector space. It has the advantage that it's always guaranteed to be 100% accurate, uh, so we can use it in cases where uh, perfect accuracy is a mandatory requirement. Uh, but it also has the disadvantage that uh, it's very inefficient in terms of time performance. Uh, this is because uh, the runtime complexity of this algorithm uh, is, uh, uh, grows linearly with the number of vectors. So if we have a very large database with uh, uh, millions of vectors, then the KNN would not be a good choice because uh, it would be too slow and it would take too long. Uh, instead, in uh, in such cases, we have to make a compromise and use a different kind of uh, algorithms uh, called approximate nearest neighbors, or ANN. Uh, these are algorithms which are um, much faster but less precise, in the sense that uh, they will return uh, uh, vectors from the neighborhood of the query vector, uh, but uh, they're not guaranteed to be the absolute closest. Uh, they're, they're just uh, close enough. Um, one uh, example of ANN algorithm uh, is uh, product quantization. Uh, let's say um, uh, these are the initial vectors from the database. Um, uh, the first step is to uh, um, partition uh, these vectors into, uh, partition them into sub-vectors, and, uh, and each partition would, would, uh, will be uh, considered separately from the other ones. Uh, then, on each partition, we um, apply the k-means algorithm and we group the subvectors into uh, various clusters. Every cluster will have uh, a centroid, and these centroids can be considered as um, approximations of the vectors from that cluster. Uh, and then, when we have a, uh, a query vector, this one is also partitioned into subvectors, and each uh, subvector is assigned to one of the clusters from that uh, partition. Uh, specifically, it's assigned to the cluster that has the nearest uh, centroid. Uh, so the idea is that instead of comparing the query vector with all the initial vectors, uh, we're comparing it with the cluster centroids, which are fewer in number. And then going to the initial uh, vectors, those that have subcomponents which are in the same clusters as the query vector are considered to be uh, the nearest uh, neighbors and are returned by the algorithm. Uh, this is how product quantization works. Um, there is a uh, trade-off between speed and precision uh, determined by the number of clusters, uh, because uh, as, we, uh, as we increase the number of clusters, uh, the clusters will be smaller, so uh, the precision will improve, but uh, it will also uh, um, uh, take long. The algorithm will also take longer because we are iterating over um, all the clusters. Uh, and of course, there are also other um, uh, ANN algorithms which are even more efficient. This, this was just uh, one example. Uh, then, after we finished uh, the retrieval, we will have uh, a list of vectors, and we know that um, these vectors uh, are associated with uh, chunks of text that are uh, similar to the user question. 
uh, now we would like to have a way of um, we would like to have a prompt, uh, a, a prompt that somehow combines the question with these uh, uh, chunks of uh, text that were retrieved. Uh, just like in the case of retrieval, there are different strategies for how to do the, the augmentation. Uh, the simplest approach is called uh, uh, the stuffing strategy. This is the name used uh, in LangChain. Uh, so in this case, we just uh, concatenate all the retrieved chunks. We give them to the LLM together with the question uh, and uh, the following instruction. Uh, use the following pieces of context to answer the question at the end. If you don't know the answer, just say you don't know. Don't try to make up an answer. Uh, it's a simple approach, but uh, for many use cases, this can be good enough. And uh, uh, the staffing strategy is, uh, is actually the uh, default used uh, uh, in LangChain. Sorry. Uh, another uh, uh, augmentation strategy, which is a little bit more complex, uh, is the map reduce strategy. So, uh, so in this one, um, again, we start with uh, uh, chunks of text which have been uh, retrieved. But this time, instead of combining them, we give them to the LLM one by one, uh, together with the question and the following instruction. Uh, use the following portion of a long document to see if uh, any of the text is uh, relevant to answer the question, return any relevant text verbatim. So here we are instructing the LLM to reduce the size uh, of the chunks uh, by uh, keeping only the most relevant pieces of information and uh, discarding anything else which is uh, not related to the question. And then after we get uh, these uh, reduced chunks, we, will, uh, uh, we just uh, repeat the steps from the um, stuffing strategy. We concatenate them and uh, we give them to the LLM and we ask it to use them for answering uh, the initial question. Uh, this is a strategy that uh, can be useful if, uh, 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 if uh, the language model has a small token limit or if uh, uh, the chunks are too large and don't fit in the context window. Uh, it also has the downside that we are making uh, here, in this case, multiple calls to the LLM API. So, uh, uh, the final uh, cost might be uh, higher, the, the usage cost might be higher, and also uh, um, uh, the, uh, wait, the waiting time for the response might be a little bit longer. Okay, uh, then after we've uh, selected all the different components of the RAC system, the similarity metric, the um, semantic search algorithm, the augmentation strategy, uh, we would like to uh, uh, have, a, have a way to evaluate that performance. Uh, the evaluation could be done uh, manually by uh, a human uh, comparing uh, uh, the questions with the generated answer and the retrieved documents. Uh, but if we want to do this uh, efficiently at uh, scale, again, we will have to use uh, an LLM. Uh, the LLM used for evaluation doesn't necessarily have to be the same one uh, as the one used for the RAC system, but it should be at least as advanced. So, for example, we could use uh, GPT 3.5 uh, to, um, to perform the RAG, and we could use GPT 4 to evaluate the RAG, but not the other way around. So, um, we give the initial documents to, the L to this LLM, and we ask it to uh, uh, generate a test set of question and uh, answer pairs. Uh, in this case, the answers can be considered uh, co uh, to be correct uh, because the LLM isn't uh, searching for anything. It receives the information as input and uh, it just have to, has to convert it into question and answer pairs, which is something an, an LLM can uh, uh, easily do. Uh, then uh, the questions are given to the RAC system one by one, and uh, for each question, uh, as we know, the, re the, retrieval, the retrieval will uh, uh, provide a few documents, uh, a few relevant documents from the database, and the LLM will uh, use them to generate an answer. <coughs> and uh, now, that we have the, now that we have these uh, four items, the question, the retrieved documents, the generated answer, and the reference answer, uh, we can uh, give them to the LLM, and. Uh, uh, the LLM can use them to uh, compute various metrics for um, the performance of the RAC system. 
Uh, here, I'm, I'm going to focus on uh, two kinds of metrics, metrics for retrieval and metrics for um, uh, generation. So on the retrieval side, we have two metrics, uh, context relevance and the context recall. Uh, cont the context relevance uh, metric uh, measures uh, if the information from the retrieved documents is uh, addressing the user question. Uh, and question recall evaluates uh, uh, how good is the match between the retrieved documents and uh, the reference answer. Uh, on the generation side, uh, we have here three metrics, answer relevance, uh, faithfulness, and answer accuracy. Uh, answer relevance uh, um, uh, measures if the generated answer is uh, uh, providing the information that was uh, requested in the question. Uh, faithfulness um, uh, tells us if the generated answer is based on uh, the information that was retrieved and doesn't contain any kind of made up information. So this is the metric that can be used to check if the model is uh, hallucinating. Uh, and uh, answer accuracy uh, evaluates uh, uh, if uh, the generated answer is consistent with the reference answer which is uh, considered uh, uh, the ground truth, uh, as I mentioned. Okay, so, uh, okay, so to conclude, uh, let's review the ways in which uh, the uh, RAG is uh, addressing the limitations of LLMs that I mentioned at the beginning uh, on the first slide. So the problem of outdated or incomplete knowledge uh, is uh, solved by uh, storing the new information in a database and uh, retrieving only what is a uh, necessary or relevant uh, through semantic search. Uh, the inability to perform actions is uh, addressed by the fact that uh, uh, the retrieval is done by the vector database and uh, the top results are just given to the LLM inside the prompt. Uh, the limited context window is um, uh, solved by uh, splitting, the, splitting the documents into smaller chunks. And in case uh, the chunks are still too big, we can also use um, an augmentation strategy like MapReduce to shrink the prompt even more. Uh, and uh, the risk of hallucination is uh, uh, reduced by um, explicitly requesting the model to admit that uh, it doesn't know uh, uh, the answer when that is the case. Uh, okay, this was all. Uh, I'm available if there are any questions, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for the great uh, presentation. So, yes, please go to the first mic to ask your questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, kind of like very interesting overview. Um, in your opinion, how like mature is the tooling for using RAGs, and do you have any suggestions of kind of like what tools should be, like now are the state of the art and should be used, or is it just kind of like, well, each of the, its own, you gave the, <laughs> you gave the theory, now go implement it. Uh, so are you familiar, for example, with uh, uh, frameworks like uh, Langchain or Lama Index? Somewhat, yes. Okay, because a lot of the things which are relevant for uh, uh, retrieval uh, for uh, RAG have already been implemented in uh, mm. Langchain, for example. So you can, uh, uh, you can implement a, a simple rank system with only a few li lines of code in, in uh, LangChain. So I would recommend either LangChain or uh, Lama Index, which is also pretty good. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question is, um, is the map reduce strategy the same as agentic rag? And if not, what's the difference? And also, um, so in the map reduce strategy, you have two LLMs. Would you suggest that you use the same LLM at both stages or different LLMs? Uh, so, in the, so to start with the second question. Uh, <coughs> uh, so in this case, um, again, this is an easy uh, this is an easy task. So you can uh, uh, you can use the same uh, LLM as uh, as you're using in the rack system. It doesn't necessarily have to be a different one. Mm. It's uh, it can be the same one. <coughs> um, and um, so can you repeat the first part of the question? Um, is this <coughs> what is referred to as agentic RAG systems, as mm. in using the a LLMs as agents? No I'm, no, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by agentic RAG system, but... Uh, so it's like this new 
relatively new term that's thrown around. Um, it's, the idea is like an LLM, different LLMs are doing different things in the system before it goes to the final LLM that generates the answer. Uh -huh. uh, no, I would say that is something much more uh, uh, general, much more complex. This is just, uh, uh, this is here you're just using the, the you're just using the, the same LLM with uh, a few extra steps uh, before uh, uh, generating the final answer. So it's, I mean, this is something much more, uh, this, uh, this is just an augmentation strategy, so it's mu much more basic than uh, uh, agentic reg. Hey, thanks for the, the great talk. I have a question regarding KNN or the uh, approximate nearest neighbors. I'm curious about the number of relevant chunks, how that's determined. I know that the, by default, it's up to the scientist or uh, uh, the engineer to determine uh, what's the best K, uh, the number. So is it here also like, is it this here, the manual step that you need to like play with it and find the K? Or is there some, let's say, process on top of it that determines it for you? Uh, well, for example, uh, well, the number of the the number of um, uh, chunks and uh, also the the, uh, the size of the chunks are uh, equally re are uh, related to each other because uh, I mean uh, remember that uh, uh, the LLM has a context window so that is uh, so that is giving you a uh, like an upper limit of how many uh, like uh, how many chunks you can uh, give it inside the prompt so that's like an upper limit uh, um, and. Uh, uh, apart from that, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, typically, uh, a typical number of chunks is uh, like uh, between uh, 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 like f four and six. But I've also seen more uh, uh, cases where uh, you don't you don't use just the most uh, uh, just the most uh, uh, the chunks that are the most uh, similar, but you also use. Uh, the chunks which are uh, the, um, uh, directly uh, before and uh, directly after the retrieved chunks, just to give it uh, even more uh, even more context mm -hmm. and make sure you're not uh, missing any relevant information. All right, so, thank you. You're welcome. Um, hello, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I was just wondering, you suggest to use um, an LLM to do evaluation of RAG, and um, I'm always a bit skeptical about such approaches, especially if you do it at scale, you can't really manually check um, everything that LLM has evaluated. So my question would be, did you check if the judgment of the LLM is somehow correlated with the judgment of experts um, to evaluate the, uh, the performance of a RAG system? Uh, so f first of all, that's why I suggested that uh, the LLM used for evaluation should be uh, more uh, advanced than the one used for the RAG system because that's uh, already giving you uh, uh, a certain of, um, uh, some assurance that uh, uh, the evaluation is meaningful. Uh, but um, so there are a few libraries uh, which are, um, uh, uh, which are, um, there are a few Python libraries which are specialized on this kind of task evaluation, like uh, RAGAS, for example, which is short for RAG assessment. And uh, the create, the, so there is a paper uh, written by uh, the, the creators of RAGAS. And uh, uh, yes, they uh, claim that they claim that they've done this kind of evaluation this kind of evaluations, and uh, it does match with uh, uh, human evaluators. I see, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, something that may be a little uh, out of scope of your talk, but uh, it would be interesting to have. In a RAG system, to have it be able to cite its sources. Do you yeah. know of any systems that like the chunks of data are tagged so that the final answer can be referring back to the original source of the information? Um, so you uh, so you want to have uh, you like to have inside the answer like uh, numbers for referring to uh, a link to a web page that the original information came from or something like that. Um, so. <coughs> So, uh, so, uh, so you can definitely, um, uh, when you when you give the answer to the user, you can also give it uh, not just the generated answer, but also the sources of, uh, uh, also the uh, the retrieved document, the documents that, that were retrieved, the entire list. Um, and uh, for example, you could uh, maybe uh, change the prompt and uh, uh, a little bit and ask uh, the language model to. 
uh, insert uh, uh, numbers after every claim it makes so that uh, it tells you which, uh, from which uh, uh, chunk uh, this claim is coming from. Uh, or another approach would be to uh, just uh, make one more LLM call with uh, the generated answer and uh, uh, these chunks and uh, uh, again to ask the LLM to um, uh, insert numbers uh, telling you which, uh, which, uh, which answer is coming from which chunk. So if you know the chunks that you gave it and you ask to give it like this was from chunk number three, yeah, 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 then yeah. you can trace it back. Yeah, okay. Exactly, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Sorry, we are out of time. Thank you so much for your questions. You can ask your question later. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, for your presentation. Thank you.